take a, a walk through what I see as my group's main challenges with respect to helping guide robots through the solar system. So what are some of the missions? Well, they're pretty ambitious. Some of them involve go taking an asteroid, bringing it back, putting it in orbit around the moon, and then building a laboratory around it, right? Doesn't sound like an easy challenge. Uh, the next is you know, maybe just helping to automate some of the cleaning. Um, I know we imagine the space station as like a 2001 space odyssey with sort of Nietzsche, you know, playing in the background from Lord Wagner's, you know. And, uh, but actually, it's an incredibly messy, very noisy, very dirty place. And so another one of the grand challenges is to develop an, an autonomous agent or semi-autonomous agent to help support with the maintenance work so that we don't have to have astronauts working on that in addition to doing experiments in space, flying spaceships, you know, things that we want them to do. And so uh, my colleagues and I at JPL, within the human interfaces group, have outlined what we see as four of the grand challenges for human-robot interaction. And actually, I think this will be a superset, and it will include Ex robotic exploration, and there will be a way for humans to mediate each one of these challenges. But the first one is whenever you have a robot that's somewhere in space, it's going to have a lot of sensors. And my God, how on earth are we? Well, how on earth? How in space are we going to um, show what it? sensors are, what it believes the state of its uh, internal systems are, what inferences it's making, uh, what it's planning. As a visualization challenge, this is tremendous. Uh, two, I think we currently command robots in a very bit by bit by bit way, but in order to accomplish really complicated tasks, like fixing a space station, we're going to need to be able to express high-level objectives. And the more naturally we can make this happen, the easier it will be for us to program the robots. And one of the things we've learned about robotic missions is that every time a robot thinks it's doing something, it's actually doing something else. <laughs> And sometimes pretty close to what you think it's doing. But we also need to recalibrate as it goes through each of its actions and how this is done either autonomously or with some kind of human in the loop is again a great unknown. And uh, last, and I think this is probably more towards the autonomy side, how can robots accomplish these goals while monitoring their own enactments. So um, let me just briefly introduce what my group at JPL is and does. And we'll talk about a subset of those things today. So we basically handle that we own the software that sends all the information to the robot from uplink to downlink. And that means that for any robot, our goal is to capture whatever we believe often the scientific high level objectives are. Fly by this moon. Uh, expose these sensors to the solar array. Um, we have to balance these with engineering constraints. In other words, the scientists may want to drive around in circles and do donuts, but the engineers are going to have second thoughts about that. Um, generally, very concerned about the health and safety of the robot. Uh, last is then to sort of validate these against flight rules, like don't point this camera directly at the sun. It's too 
to sense it if you'll really the sensor. Right? And then on the downlink side, uh, we actually write the software that collects all of the scientific data that uh, was, you know, uh, get, I guess, created through experimentation. Um, that uh, we, we want to update what everyone believes to be the, um, the set of the environment of the robot itself. And uh, we want to be able to assess the health of the robot. So this is a pretty broad charge. It's basically saying, take everything that we send to the robot and bring back to the robot and just and, and own that software. So um, if I can just, it, it's actually an incredibly humbling honor to be, to be given this responsibility. And um, so I, I, let me please thank the, the faculty for helping to make that happen somehow. Thank you. I don't know how that happened, but I feel very happy. Um, so, you know, the, there, ah, yes. So basically, we need to do that for, um, for 16 uh, instruments. So we've talked a lot about Curiosity, and she's in the news a lot, but uh, the, the Mars exploration, uh, one of the rovers is still active after nine years. Cassini's around Saturn, Juno's going to Jupiter. Uh, so there's all of that problem times 16. Um, and so I was gonna talk about how on Earth we, and in order to make this happen, we have to uh, take what hundreds of scientists around the world for every mission want, uh, and for any number of instruments that uh, exist on each spacecraft, uh, and they're distributed in various countries around the world, and on the cycle of every day, come up with one plan, and do this for all the 16 robots. So when in the um, uh, abstract, I talked about office work, but I was really talking about was what we could learn about collaboration. Uh, but it turns out that, there we go, that uh, Jennifer Tazy, who will be visiting us uh, here at CMU in two weeks, is actually going to talk about that. And, uh, and uh, since she'll get the last word, I don't want to actually say anything. So, actually, out of respect for her, I'm going to choose a separate subject and really talk about this vision of what I think the grand challenges are that face human-robot interaction and how my group is positioning what we, how we're going to solve them and the baby steps that we've taken towards them. So first, let me introduce you to uh, two of the robots that are the main platforms for our experimentation. Uh, the first is the athlete. Uh, athlete is about a 12 foot tall hexapod robot. Um, it's so badass. <laughs> um, it's designed to be flexible, uh, function on multiple missions, and be given a variety of tasks. So you can see here, it's designed to hold a crew capsule over rough terrain and keep it level. Um, but it's also designed, for example, uh, to be able to get off a lander. <laughs>
In that example, it was taking a payload off a lander, so similar to an Apollo-class lander. So what landed on the moon that contained Armstrong and Aldrin would actually have then been able to just drive away. And that's the vision of one of the capabilities of this robot. Um, but the hands are also very agile and designed to be tools. And so each one is designed to be able to function as a motor. And here we have a gripper that's going to pick up this battery pack and then drive with it uh, and put it down. see the camera from the view of the actual tool itself. So you have a robot that can do multiple things with multiple arms that are also hands that don't move like a human being. So puppet show that, right? I mean, that's very, how would you control this? How would you tell it what to do? Um, it's Excuse me. Uh, and also, part of its configuration is, in its versatility, is designed to be able to actually lay a payload down and then uh, separate and become. Excuse me. It takes it a while. This is kind of a balancing act. To try my robots. <laughs> So it's actually two tripod robots, um, but six um, has a lot more flexibility. And so you can send each one of these little guys off, and uh, there's a lot to control. What do we want to do with uh, uh, with athlete in addition to working on lunar surface projects? Uh, well, one would be to uh, visit some of the near Earth asteroids. Uh, you know, why is this hard? Well, you know, these are not planet-sized. Uh, here is an asteroid, uh, kind of peanut-shaped, about 11 kilometers uh, solid nickel, from what we've learned from flybys. But here's one that's very, very gritty and not solid at all. So if we were to try and move on it, I mean, it could easily just break apart. So we, there's very little knowledge about the actual internal structure of an asteroid. And similarly, its gravitational field. So if you were to go into orbit around it, uh, how that might vary based on the density. And to give you a sense of the sort of scale of these things, uh, here's that same asteroid over the Golden Gate Bridge. So instead of landing at, uh, you know, a landing on a planet, which is a lot bigger target, uh, you know, you're talking about here, uh, kilometers wide. Um, the other platform for our robotic exploration is uh, Robonaut. And Robonaut is an anthropomorphic robot and uh, largely designed for maintenance tasks and with the goal of being about as dexterous as an astronaut in a spacesuit. So, as you can see, it can move and do things uh, that, um, well, I can't, but <laughs> probably astronauts can. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, incredibly agile, and especially when working under controlled circumstances, this sort of actuation uh, is it's much more like a dance um, because if you moved the weight two inches to the left, this wouldn't happen. Um, and so you, you have this problem. There, there is a lot of dexterity, right? But it's, it's very specifically programmed for a controlled environment. Um, this is really amazing demonstration. So there is true dexterity but you can see here this is uh, you know, being controlled. And also, I don't know if you can see here, that's like the holy shit button. <laughs> we have a lot of those in our lab. Why does it have to be the same shape as a human? Why can't it have three arms? Or why is it need to have a head? Um, 
Well, one of the reasons is that the general idea was to create a multi-purpose uh, problem-solving machine, and there's a huge infrastructure already designed to be solved by individuals, by humans, and so I think um, the idea of the totally general purpose hand, the best example that we have is, is the human hand so far. And so I don't think NASA's against having it an octopus, but, you know. Um, but uh, I think right now, one of the things that I think is a, is a genuine big question that I think could take the rest of the, the talk is why don't you just build like a specialized screwdriver hand? So instead of a hand, have a screwdriver hand and have a drill hand. Like why does it have to pick up a drill? Um, and so actually retooling the entire space station is one of the things under consideration as opposed to making a general purpose robot. There's always going to be things that that general purpose robot, that the, the tool-handed robot can't and so the idea of having something that can function in an environment that we can't really tell is something that I think is the goal of robotics in general, but not necessarily the best idea for engineering in the short term. Um, but can I put the rest of the question on hold, Stephen, because I think it's an excellent one, but I really feel like we could talk about it for the rest of the time here. Um, so, assuming that this is a good idea, which again, not necessarily, but it's one of the platforms that we have for exploration. Um, you know, in looking at what would be the right shape for this environment, um, it's pretty unclear. And if you're certainly going to have a robot trying to weave its hands through and grab a cable and unlock it and then weave it around. Uh, yeah, I mean, a hand works good, but maybe a snaky arm would work too. But this is what we have. And uh, I guess until you build us a $10 million robot with the snake arm, we're going to use that. <laughs> um, so let me talk about what my group is doing to take on what these grand questions are. Now, let me state that uh, these are first steps. Um, I have been at JPL for five months. So we're, we're not, they're not solved yet. I think it'll be some time, but I'd like to show you the work that we're making to experiment with one direction or another. So I think one of the first questions is how to represent what the state of a robot would be during a particular task. So if you look at um, here, if we go back to the model of an athlete when I was doing his dance, uh, we actually have uh, you know, an, an, an internal model uh, simulation of the robot that is actually going at the same time. And, and you can see, right, there's a delay. It's not exactly the same spot. Um, but the work that we do uh, generally has a variety of cameras in a number of places. Let us know the sensor values. I don't know if you saw, but as it lifted its leg, this leg went up. You can see the camera showing the leg go up. There's so many numbers to look at. It's just sort of mind-boggling uh, to figure out which are the right ones. And it, it, it's a, as a six-limbed uh, organism, once it kind of turns around, which leg is leg to? And, and but yet we kind of need to know these things. So orientation becomes a real problem, especially in three space. 
So we've tried to simplify some of the issues with driving the robot. And one of them is, for example, to just show a spider graph that shows the forces on the various uh, you know, or different uh, measurements on each of the legs. So you can see here in this one that the, there's actually something <coughs> happening to the wheel on the, on the uh, L3 because the force is increasing. So this kind of graph makes it a little bit more visible. And uh, you could potentially have a variety of these. Or at the same time, we have, uh, you know, on the same display, individual models of each joint and ones that show the force distribution at each joint. And so you can interact with them and see the different levels and s switch between legs, see when the brake is engaged and not. Uh, and of course, just move between uh, you know the different legs and the different positions. So you know this was one of our first ventures into having, and, and so this is application is available on a tablet while you walk through the desert or wherever with the actual robot to allow you to see the real time telemetry. So I think it's the problem that I think has some of the most depth and that we have the most capability to solve, but because of its complexity, we haven't really taken it on yet. And I think what we've worked on more is this challenge too, which is how to naturally express a uh, complex motion plan in terms of high level objectives. So one of the ways that we've really advocated is using off-the-shelf hardware and hacking it so that we can actually do things like with the wheat chuck and just be able to actually drive the robot. And so we've actually just mapped the, uh, you know, the, the thumbstick to the directions with one of the legs being forward and We've made it so that forward is forward, and that's probably the hardest part of this to constantly remember. And then, if you want to go left, uh, the robot will actually go left, and it can go it can go left, but can also turn left in a in a single spot by turning its wheels into a circle. And so you turn it by twisting the angle of the wheat chuck. And so if you were to turn it like this, the robot would spin in this pattern. So you can actually have it turn while spinning in sort of this pirouette kind of way. Um, and then when you're direct doing both together, that's how it makes an arc. And then uh, we basically have a uh, what they call it, kill switch. Right? Like if, if you're squeezing it, the robot will drive, but if you let go and stuff. Yes? Is this explored just like having a miniature version of the robot, the little hand puppet version of it, and wherever you move it, it moves? It's kind of a reflection of your movements? Yes, we have. It's. Uh, then you have to do the mental translation of how you I can imagine that, that being interesting in terms of how you lay out the terrain around your little puppet robot. Mm -hmm. Like here's the surface of the, the mm -hmm. land where we're surveying. And right. kind of, it's almost like going back to playing with trucks in the sandbox. <laughs> and it's really fun. Uh, so I have slides. Uh, I'll show you. Uh, I don't actually think I have them with me, but we have a puppet robot that we've made. Um, you know, and it articulates and the robot legs move. Um, it, the challenges with this in particular are that it's, it's much more limited to uh, like a level ground mission. And um, the, the capabilities that digital afford, like looking at variations or uh, copying, 
which are things that other versions of systems that I'll show you that we track, um, they provide just different benefits. Um, but it's, I think, an interesting way to go. And we haven't tried it on a complicated task. Um, and I'm curious to see what would happen and how it would negotiate the imprecision of your actions with like the real world. Like if you told it to pick a suitcase up but didn't really get it right, um, what would happen? And so I think there are interesting analogs and other problems to solve if you want to go down that alley. But I think there's a lot down there. And we have a puppet hexapod robot if you want to play with. We're looking. I'm here looking for collaborators. In case that was um, one of the issues that becomes especially complicated is when dealing with the asteroid type missions is that these problems are spatial problems. And so the asteroid, the robot isn't just which direction is it, but which way is up and where is it up in orbit around a robot, I'm sorry, in orbit around an asteroid and how is it moving. And so we've been working with desktop virtual reality uh, systems to allow us, excuse me, to uh, experiment with being able to position the robot in a a, a VR space. A faster, less human involved control method would be desirable for positioning the end detector. My name is Mark. And I'm Charles. Here at JPL, we want to. <laughs> Sorry. These are two of my guys, and they, they made a video uh, about server. And I think they're having fun with it. I forgot to. <laughs> a faster, less human involved control method would be desirable for positioning the end detector. My name is Mark. And I'm Charles. Here at JPL, we wanted to investigate a novel control approach using a device called Z-Space. The Z-Space system provides a 3D display, head tracking, and a track stylus for six degree of freedom input. We found that it was most natural to have an athlete's end effector match the position and orientation of the stylus. As the user moves or rotates the stylus in real life, a virtual stylus follows the same movement and rotation. A simulated athlete moves its end effector to track with the virtual stylus. A reachability map is generated and is displayed in green on the asteroid. Using head tracking, the operator can look around the scene to get different perspectives on athlete and its surroundings. In our application, the user can naturally and easily drill into targets on an asteroid. User testing has garnered universally positive results. In the future, <laughs> this application can be used to greatly speed up athlete operations. <laughs> they're, they're good guys. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think I'll see if I can. Um, So, excuse me a second, while I resolve that. I'm just learning Keynote. A faster, less human involved control method would be desirable for positioning the end effector. My name is Mark. I'm John. Here at JPL, we wanted to investigate a novel control approach using a device called Z-Space. The Z-Space system provides a 3D display, head tracking, and a track stylus for six degree of freedom input. We found that it was most natural to have an athlete's end effector match the position and orientation of the stylus. So that sort of manipulation in 3Space uh, turns out to be a very natural way to tell the robot where you'd like it to position its end effector. And here, the task was a drilling task. And um, it was so successful that this is really one of the ways that we're going to continue with going forward. Stylus. As the user moves or rotates the stylus in real life, a version. So, uh, so far, we, with that prototype system, we've run some pilot user studies, and I'll just provide uh, uh, some, you know, uh, some takeaways. Uh, with the caveat of an end being embarrassingly small to actually say in it. Let me 
be able to send them. So uh, we could see that people were excited about it, but what was also interesting was that there was a, a distrust with the simulation in that, for example, unrealistic physical constraints could produce impossible behaviors that move too quickly to be realistic. I don't know if you can see, but when the robot would just sort of swing around, uh, we didn't really have the physics model defined well enough to actually tell it, no, you, you can't do that. Or even if it would need to go totally around and backwards, it just allowed the, uh, surprisingly, allowing the operators a lot of freedom in a way that would have caused them to break the robot in the past, made them distrust the system. Even if we could have calculated not to make that problem happen. And so here is a very interesting uh, real capability that actual users were very, very careful and cautious about. Um, another, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the by moving your head, you were able to, to rotate the camera, but you weren't actually able to rotate the, uh, I'm sorry, you were able to rotate the scene, but uh, head tracking moved the camera, but there was really, in the way that we created, no way to move this the entire scene. And one of the things that the mechanical engineers who were in charge of drilling told us is that when they were doing drilling, that they would get down on the floor and look right at the where the drill bit was going. So they wanted the simulation to give them that level of precision, which it did. And so it's important that uh, the virtual reality system be allow for both movement of your head around the scene, but movement of the scene as well. Um, and uh, also, we didn't include the tool cameras, and basically all the operators said, we use the tool cameras all the time, they're our favorite tool. So, um, you know, in trying to make something totally virtual, they, the feedback was that there's some sensors that uh, give us really reliable feedback. Let's not get rid of them. Uh, another approach that we took is to look at some of the capabilities of a multi-touch large display. And here we built a, a system to allow a, a planner to, uh, to uh, create a possible trajectory uh, onto an asteroid using waypoints and to be able to move the waypoints and to be able to uh, change their distances and locations. Um, so let's show you what. Uh, is this the right? Okay, well, that, there's a demo there, but the main idea that I think we got in our feedback of testing this system was that while we allowed for a planner to express one particular trajectory, we didn't allow for conditional branching. And this is something where, for example, sometimes on approach, uh, certain conditions or sensor values would fire events or certain constraints would be violated that would need to be accounted for. And so our system didn't have enough of the logic to actually uh, have perform in the way that a real system does. And so what we really needed to do was to embed and deeply understand the flight rules so that if a, uh, in designing an approach, the, uh, you know, the scientists created a path that had too high of an arc that would have created too much friction, uh, that the system would have let them know. Uh, similarly, it was interesting, we created this system to allow a lot of direct manipulation. And so you can put the, you know, the robot in a particular space. But uh, 
interestingly, the uh, planners also just asked for the ability to make numerical adjustments. So they liked being able to say, I want to put it roughly there, but I want to put it 0.2 degrees further, and not that precision. You can't make it with hands. And this is something that they wanted based on, I think, a very numerical understanding of the way that these uh, various positions work. And you want them to be very precise. Um, so, uh, again, we had really only provided one camera view, um, and we didn't really provide uh, different resolution and orientation. And so, again, being able to not just see the perspective from the god's eye, but the perspective from what it'd be like underneath the lander when it lands. Uh, this is something that they wanted to experiment with when they were planning. Uh, and last was that uh, a lot of calibration was, was, was necessary. So in other words, they would say they really couldn't trust sensor values, um, especially when driving in unknown terrain. So if the robot is driving over a moon rock and the sensor says the rock is six feet in front of it, um, what they really want to do is reach out and touch the rock and then know how far that is. And so d double check their sensor measurements to account for errors. And so this recalibration is an important part of how they plan for actual motion. And so even moving to something as simple as moving around a rock would require moving near the rock, seeing how far from the rock you are by touching it, then moving away, then moving around, then touching it again. And so I think that speaks nicely to this you know, Grand Challenge 3, how, how, how to recalibrate um, uh, plans and sensor data. So I think in working with the simulation of the Robonaut, we attempted some of this kind of sensor recalibration. So here is a small demo from the system, the gestural system that uh, one of the uh, one of our group members put together. telemetry data from the athlete and in front of the athlete is a drill and a flashlight. Um, but what you're seeing are point cloud representations of them. And the idea here is to create a gestural system so that an individual can reach into the space and grab the drill and bring it towards them. So they use a natural uh, method of reaching in and picking up. And one of the things that they would do during this experience was that they would reach in and then they would see where the simulated athlete's hand was. And then they would adjust their hand accordingly and adjust their hand accordingly. So a system like that where there's a tighter time loop allowed for more precise uh, coordination. Uh, also there are problems and the athlete doesn't I'm sorry, the Robonaut doesn't map perfectly to a sort of anthropic idea of a human being. In other words, the hand could be in a certain place and you could put your hand there, but the elbow would be in a way that would be impossible for a person. And so we found people uh, trying to match the, the, <laughs> the Robonaut by you know, uh, basically you pick up the flashlight and then it's easiest for the robot to go like that. And uh, so we just do it, right? And that's not something that you wouldn't think of. So people try to imitate that and of course it, you can't really do that. Um, so uh, also errors in the effector. So if 
there was an error in actually where the hand, where, where the system believed the hand was, uh, then it propagated so that there were errors throughout the system about where it believed the arm was and where it believed. Uh, let me let me just move quickly because we're running out of time here. Um, we haven't tried this one yet, uh, and I think. Uh, if you're uh, interested in robotics and planning, uh, that we are certainly looking for partners who would be capable at helping us to make that kind of uh, algorithmic determination. So uh, just to summarize, uh, this work that I'm describing really covers uh, work that um, is, has been performed by collectively the 5,000 people who work at JPL. Um, and I'm told I'm supposed to say, and look how beautiful it is. <laughs> it, that it does look kind of nice. But, um, uh, so, and then, you know, within my group, uh, we are, uh, I'm also here looking for research collaborators, but uh, also to be clear to the master students who I'll be meeting with on Friday, uh, my group is growing and I am looking to recruit a design lead, a user researcher, an expert in info vids, and people who can uh, produce uh, web service front ends. Um, so, I guess at that point, um, I'll say uh, I've got a lot of neato demos if, if you want to play with them later, but I, I think I'd like to allow some time for questions. So thanks very much. Yes, please. I'm kind of curious, you obviously mentioning about orienting uh, athlete. And is there a reason that, um, I was just thinking, would color coding the different limbs work? Or is there stuff about NASA white paint that's super special? Um, so color coding the limbs, for example, in both the control system and the actual robot. So you, when you look at the robot, you'll be able to see parallels. Um, no, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and I think that's actually a pretty good idea. Basically, the engineers who put it together like to count <laughs> more than they like colors. <laughs> and so, when you say to them, "How would you like to move the move the leg up?" they you can see them do the mental math of orienting themselves to the reference frame of the knee and then trying to count spaces from there. So they see the world as the same geometry that they've programmed and I think that's part of the problem that we're trying to help them overcome. Colors are a simple good idea. Um, a lot of really responsive interfaces, but how would you deal, like if you were on an astral or in the or a similar situation, how would you deal with uh, communication? So I think that's one of the principal challenges of this kind of system, you know, entirely. So there's, there's two, you know, two ways to monitor it. One is you build robots that can do everything on their own and then they don't need you. But since I don't really think that's going to happen anytime soon, what you'd like to do is to, depending on the lag, allow a robot to, to do something and take on some kind of movement and then check in with you about the progress and recalibrate what they see as their own performance of that goal. And so if it's at the moon, and you're looking at roughly a two second delay back and forth. It's not nearly as bad as something that in the, you know, 
your bell. It could be 40 minutes back and forth. In which case, you really want to be able to enable the, ask, the, the robot to have more autonomy with respect to landing. Like, you're not going to be able to control it in the same way. And so, it depends on the, the distance. And I think one of the ways that you answer it is by asking the human to provide that recalibration and by asking the, um, the robot and by telling the robot to do something enough that you've learned it can capably do within a comfortable margin of error. Right? I mean, you know there's going to be a margin of error. So if you ask, if you know if the robot walks 20 feet and it's usually two feet wrong, and that's probably not acceptable in a building. So you'd ask it to go five feet and check in. And so that loop is not really well defined. And I think that, that communication cycle is also one of the principal problems. So those tools would be used more for planning than for actual interaction. Well, I think they'd be used for interaction, but just not joystick. Right. So I mean, like, if you're, if you're telling the robot to go closer, now go closer, now go closer, you know, you're, you're definitely in some form of control, but not totally. Yeah, please. What's that, the 3D effector stylus control? Mm -hmm. um, was that, I guess this is kind of place up that question, but is that designed to be a just move here and do the next thing? Or is that like setting waypoints as you go and then flying it back in the simulator and then saying, okay, now mm -hmm. play the back of the robot? I think it's, I mean, in many ways, what you described it as a planning tool is a way to look at, uh, compare various outcomes. How would this look? How would this look? And then, given the complexity of the, what the actual plan was, you would decide how much you would allow the robot to do without checking in again. So I don't think you would ask it to do something immediately. Um, in very few situations can I imagine there'd be a, that type of a feedback loop and that accurate of a sensor response without noise. Like you'd really move and want to count. Thank you. 
don't think it would be well received if I knocked on the door of the Mars rover team and suggested an update to their software today. However, they plan to have a 10 year life cycle and they did invite us to help them with a prototyping workshop so that we could help stimulate their team to explore a variety of different ideas. And so even in the entrenched projects where there's room for change, uh, we're having the ability to influence, but it's in, it's in pieces, right? It's a heavily engineering uh, uh, dominated culture and it really requires small successes on our part in order to gain the trust of other groups to try and you know, risk involving us. And so some of the, um, let's see if I have it here. You know, I've, I've been within my own team building a culture of really lo-fi prototyping and, you know, sort of for space robots. They're, that's just a very hard concept for them to grasp. It seems like kind of a risk, which makes sense. So for example, this is the prototype that we put together in an afternoon that led to the idea to find Z space. So we were trying to think, how would you tell a robot uh, to, to take that garbage can and move it over there and empty it? And so uh, basically my designer created uh, basically some sticky note, oh, sorry, I can't see this. Um, just, you know, sticky notes on a window. And, you know, so the idea being that the window was the 2D screen and the world is the world that we wanted to act on. And I had to make a, a prototype that basically said, okay, you know, use some kind of selector to identify this is a trash can, and so that we have con concepts, web wire mesh concepts of structures that explain their capabilities roughly and to drag it onto the screen and to place it over the, um, the trash can where it then, this is a little bit messy, uh, a, a menu would appear and um, it would say uh, move, select destination, and then with the stylus he would select over there and then the um, trash can itself would move. Uh, I'm not sure what that is representing. Ah, and then what you, it's a little bit cut off here, is the idea that we're building a timeline at the top so that we'd be able to change the sequence. Um, and also when you do lo-fi prototypes like this, you just get random dudes in your <laughs> I'm sure he didn't sign a photo disclosure. <laughs> Um, you know, so here's, here's the trash can, empty it, and uh, this is what the screen would show so that we've created a wire mesh of the trash can, show that we're going to empty it, and then if we wanted to change, you could see how he's pointing up top. But this is, you know, this was an afternoon, and I basically said, come up with a prototype and test it with somebody today. And this is the way that the culture gets changed because they say, what, how can I possibly do that? Give them a couple of examples and I've worked with them in steps and I think they're slowly understanding the concepts of prototyping what are complicated um, user enactments, one might say. Okay, that was a long answer. So, when you talk about uh, planning and decision making and part of the robots, I'm wondering mm -hmm. 
is it a goal to make this process similar to that of human beings? We've been talking a lot about recalibration. I'm sorry, similar to? Um, to that of like how humans make decisions and assess situations where some situations uh, humans might be more impulsive and they might not take a step back and recalibrate. Is it the goal to make the robot system like that or will they always be sort of recalibrating and assessing? My guess would be that uh, NASA is very conservative with risks with space assets. So uh, I don't think I would ever hear the word impulsive in a, you know, in a description of a, like a, an autonomy uh, algorithm. And so <laughs> my guess is that just in general, it, 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 the idea wouldn't be to simulate a human but to simulate a system that could be really, really carefully monitored by a huge team of people back on it. And so, so a simple answer would be no. But I think it's just a little bit, there are reasons for that. And it's, it's largely just the, the costs and risks. Um, I mean, I think one thing you'll see is that if you've been following Curiosity, it took four days for Curiosity to like make it go go ten inches forward, or ten inches back. So right, they, it took a, a whole couple of days before they just moved forward and moved back, so that they could look at the sand and see what's the texture of the sand on. Um, I think that's the kind of activity that teleoperation generally. Uh, that's the metaphor that teleoperation. Uh, operates under because if anything goes wrong, there's no second chance. And that's pretty much it. So that's what I mean by risk of Yeah, yeah. So what type of delay is for the, the UI or the actual transmission of information takes time? But um, there's also the delay of the technology. So curiosity is what, like two gigabytes of memory or some sense of thing fairly small. Do you think that the, the data technology that you might be using um, out there might have some impact on uh, how forward thinking you can be with the UI down here, or are they completely separate? No, ultimately, the plan that you send the robot is the main constraint. And the amount of autonomy on Curiosity, for example, is relatively limited compared to like a planner, like an automated planner, because of the limitations of RAM and processor. So there definitely are hard limitations on both the embedded software and the commands that you would send. And those are really going to continue to exist for some time. Excuse me, because the need so I didn't really understand this when I, before I came, but I was just, you know, one of the best things about JPL is when, if you want to understand, like, why the hell are the computers so slow, like, you knock on the door of the guy who designed the computers and ask him, and he'll get mad. <laughs> but he will explain that um, the, in order to protect every transistor, they have to be separated by a layer of because the environment, it's not just the temperature really, but the radiation of space that's much more likely to do damage. And so it's a circuit board where like each transistor has its own layer of protection. So it's not like a board where how many transistors can you cram into a space. It's like how many tiny little houses can you put in this board. And that really, limits the computational power. And so that's one of the other reasons why a human in the loop is, I think, a good long-term answer for some of these problems. I don't know if I answered your question, but I like talking to the guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's lots of fun to ask them. Yeah. Uh, so the recognized humanoid uh, how do you consider or is it planned that it's going to interact with a human on the campus? Yes. It's part of the long-term plan for Robonaut is that it would be, uh, well, there's many potential roles. 
that it would be a collaborator on, for example, a mission to fix a solar panel, where just the amount of materials that an astronaut, an astronaut would need to hold, uh, make sure to manage uh, extra parts that they could bring as flexible options. So a, a robot could perform as a robotic support system. That's one of the roles, definitely, that they have, you know, envision for robot. Another is, you know, uh, autonomous, like just going out there and fixing the solar panel itself. I mean, in part because to get an astronaut ready for a spacewalk takes four hours, and then afterwards, four hours to undo. So before they've done anything, it takes eight hours let alone in like the 20 hour space one. So if you can imagine you just sort of like put the rope on it in the airlock and you know, kick him out, it's a lot better of an answer if it could work. So that's what I think NASA's really betting on. Yeah. Um, can this maybe stemming from that a little bit, but earlier you mentioned that the
specifically slated for space flight for at least a decade. So already looking quite futuristic. There's probably labs in other parts of, uh, I don't know, different uh, defense organizations, maybe that sounds like that would support something like that. Um, but not, I don't know of anything in NASA that's working with brain. Uh, oh, well, I didn't mean that specifically. It's much more like, do you, just do you start, do you mention fossil fuels, like the we are you looking more for, is that one of your constraints, or do you uh, sort of push it, push it to the next No, level? no, I, I think the we just helps us with the prototyping. I think where we really build something, we build something that I think helps the function to the real constraints that we needed uh, if, unless the Microsoft, you know, or Nintendo device actually functioned by itself. But they do have probably monthly blue sky meetings, they call them, where they invite the more imaginative thinkers to do come up with these crazy ideas. And they are crazy, and they're really wonderful. And they publish, maybe they publish, I don't actually know, those are things that I should be talking about. <laughs> but they do, they, they do have meetings. And for example, the principal investigator of the athlete project is named Brian Wilcox. And so if you look him up in his work, you'll see that he's often one of the people who's involved in that kind of blue sky thinking. And you know, we'll sort of have a vision, and then two weeks later you'll sit down with Brian and he'll just change your mind about everything because he's had another idea. So, I mean, there's that kind of person does exist there and they're wonderful to have access to. One more? Yes. Just have uh, one quick question. Is the firmware on a robot that's on mission uh, locked in or is there potential to update that? Um, well, I'm sure you don't mean like can we update the firmware on the, oh wait, so for example. So like if you guys come up with an awesome idea and for a new interface, but you need to. Yes, so definitely. Okay. So for example, when Curiosity is in flight, it only has the software for entry, descent, and landing. It has no uh, software for ground mission because they take up all of the RAM with, uh, you know, with the need everything that is needed to handle the EDL, because if they don't do that, then nothing else matters. And so we actually literally radiate a whole new version of the OS. And um, that's one of the reasons why they take five, six days to like get it, you know, get it moving, because they really want to make sure everything works. Because it's like doing a remote install from